But I want to start with how we frame the problem because in my experience at least, the sustainability discourse out there in the world uh, has become a, a, a discourse about limits and constraints. Uh, planetary boundaries, limits to growth, whatever decade you want to pick, there's some famous examples of this kind of argument being made. And what that means is uh, there's a lot of good science behind all of that, of course, uh, and, it's, and there are limits and constraints of various kinds. But when it gets elevated to the level of the societal discourse, the narrative we tell ourselves, the story we tell ourselves about what sustainability means, um, it's problematic, I think. It's a storyline that, that basically what we're up to is harm reduction and damage limitation, uh, cutting back, and often explicitly a story about sacrifice. So you've all heard this story. This is a story about how we're kind of evil uh, uh, species. Uh, collective racial suicide would be the best thing we could do for the environment. Uh, but in the meantime, if we're going to hang around, we have to just kind of reduce everything. Um, turns out there's some problems with this as a narrative, as a, as a way we tell the story to people. I think there's at least four problems with it. Won't go into them too much, but Clearly, it's not very motivating. People don't jump on the bandwagon of cutting back and reducing and sacrifice and leap to the forefront of the social movement of doing without. It just doesn't turn out to be a very energizing and motivating agenda. We keep preaching and waving our finger, wagging our finger at people, telling them how bad they are because they have an SUV uh, or whatever, uh, almost anything, actually, uh, that they have. Uh, it's not very motivating. I think it doesn't go far enough. We have to go way beyond harm reduction and damage limitation. We have to be restorative and regenerative. We have to make things better, not just less bad. So it's not even adequate as, a, as an agenda, um, even if it was motivating. It's mostly environmental. This is deeply ironic because the term sustainability was coined. Lester Brown, 1981, Brundtland Commission, 1987, precisely to broaden the scope beyond the environmental and to include the social and the economic. And yet, if you ask the average mythical person in the street, at least where I come from, what does sustainability mean? They come up with an environmental answer. So we failed to, to, to broaden the way we thought we were with the language. And it's very scientistic. <clears throat> and I don't want to go too deeply into this, but this idea that science is a truth machine telling us true things about the real world that tell us how we have to live and what we have to do um, is deeply problematic. We have 100 years of science studies that show how problematic that way of thinking about science is. <clears throat> and it's poisoned, <clears throat> for example, the climate change debate. I think we've really failed, and I've spent a lot of years in that arena failing. <clears throat> because of the way we frame the, the story. So the argument is that maybe a different framing would be helpful. Can we think of human activity that is not just less bad, but actually more good? That is not just about reducing damage, it's about creating benefit. It's not just about sacrifice, it's about contribution. From net zero, to pick a common term in the buildings field, to net positive. Could we imagine human activities that have these characteristics? In other words, human activity that doesn't have to be minimized because it's so damaging, human activity that actually improves simultaneously human and environmental welfare, well-being. And notice the two crucial components of this approach. One is it's both human well-being and environmental well-being. This isn't about uh, subjecting the human to the overriding environmental agenda. Human well-being is a goal in and of itself. They both are. They both have to be achieved. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, <coughs> increasing, net positive, making things better. Now, there's lots of things, lots of places where we can't do this where harm reduction is the best we can do. There's lots of harm out there that needs to be reduced on both the human and social side and on the environmental side, for sure. But the argument here is just that first, we should look for regenerative options. They're always better. It's always better to create benefit than just to reduce cost. It's always better to make things better than just make them less bad. So we should look first for regenerative opportunities. We can always go back to harm reduction if we can't find them. The question is, what processes and what scale? Could we have a regenerative building? Well, we've built one at UBC, and we think uh, it's actually not that hard. Could we have a regenerative industrial system, a regenerative transportation network, regenerative city? 
Surely the kind of city we want to live in is a city that by its normal operating procedures makes human environmental well-being improve, get better, right? That, that's, that's the city we would want. Whether we can have it or not, that's the question. But that's, that's what we should be looking for, trying to answer that question. 